Welcome to the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show, a broadcast service of globalbusinessnews.net. Now, here's your host, Ed Cohen. It's Ed Cohen, your broadcast host on Global TV Talk Show, a service of globalbusinessnews.net. Globalbusinessnews.net has been active since 2003. Google Analytics, if you can believe all that, says that since then we've had about 1.2 million reader page views. So, of course, we're thankful for you to be here today. Our very special guest is Mr. Jeff Altman, who in the past has been the big game hunter. (laughs) In other words, finding the big person for that special job. Let's say hi to Jeff. Howdy. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Really happy to have you. Nice to meet you. So I I happen to be in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in Maui, and you're on the East Coast in the hills of North Carolina. Is that correct? I'm in Asheville, North Carolina, a lovely place, and um, less in the way of the COVID universe than many places have. Yeah. Um, How long have you uh, lived there? We moved here just about 10 years ago uh, from the New York area. Uh, We came to a point where our son was aging out of schools that we thought were good for him. Frankly, I didn't like the congestion in New York anymore because, you know, if you're watching on video, this is not a 24-year-old's face anymore. So the idea of uh, a place in the world that was a little bit easier uh, was something attractive to me. And knowing that the technology was such that I could work from anywhere. We went to a place that was uh, comfortable, convenient, easy, lovely. So I want to ask you, Jeff, about what you're doing today. And then I want to jump back, back, back and and what lead you to what you're doing today. So you are now a, a coach, a career coach and a leadership expert, leadership development. And your site also talks about risk. So whose risk? My risk or the company's risk? Well, I I handle a number of different things. So because of my work in search, which I did for more than 40 years, I developed a real world perspective on employment. Couple that with a master's in social work and postgraduate psychoanalytic training, I have a breadth of of complex experiences that I've melded in ways to be very useful for job hunters. It's also very useful for employers with their hiring process, and it helps, well, I'm able to help individuals be more effective in their leadership because I think a lot of people get trained to believe that what I would call managing is leading. That is, you control people's behavior, you you try and make them produce X number of widgets or X amount of information per day, and you crank it out there, as opposed to inspiring people and bringing out the best in them. They bring the hammer out and they beat those people to a pulp as though they're in the galleys on those slave ships that we've seen in all those movies uh, for so many years. Oh my. So uh, leadership, is this uh, finding someone and making them a leader or is this already dealing with an executive that needs to learn something new? It's whatever's referred to me. So sometimes it's an individual who's struggling in their leadership. Sometimes it's an executive who's at a high level in an organization and wants a confidant to work with him Uh. or or with whomever in their organization they need me to work with. So that in this way, that person has an ally to sort things out with, who's working with them, is there to serve them, not necessarily the institution, but to serve the individual and help them perform at a higher level. Like a great example is a guy who I've known for a number of years. I've coached him. He runs sales for an organization and you know, he has an anger management issue. How does it show up? 
management promises him things and they fail to deliver and he gets frustrated. So it's helping him with the process so he doesn't blow his top. He's able to get more effective results. And certainly in running a sales organization during times like this, it's complicated because you can't so, walk in on a customer site. Right. And it's all virtual now. Right. And how do you manage your sales organization during times like that? This is a big issue, and there's not, not an easy answer. This is not one answer. There's probably multiple answers to performance. I mean, you, if, if my dog or my wife walked behind me right here, you'd see her, you know, and, you know, rather than in the office where you don't have hardly any personal contact with somebody down the hall uh, that you see every day. Um, was, so, but in this way, you brought into the home and exposure is way different. And in, with sales professionals during times like this, the sales professionals who struggle have the built in excuse of, Oh, no one wants to see me. They don't want to talk to me. It's terrible. I really <laughs> dislike it. Uh, and it's very frustrating, but I'm trying and they aren't. They aren't. So how do you manage under circumstances like that with responsibilities to manage up and at the same time manage down? Yeah, so, so did, your social work uh, is actually a psychiatrist, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you're being a psych. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I'm not a practicing psychiatrist. I don't prescribe <laughs> drugs, <laughs> nothing along those lines. But I help people sort out stuff in a safe place where they can say stupid stuff and not feel as though there's going to be any retribution. That's the cool so, thing about it from their standpoint. So let's say you, you, you found a, a, an old hippie uh, who's reformed and he, he or she, let's say just he, um, is still reading and talking about Zen stuff and, you know, the, the, the flow, feeling the flow of ideas and uh, the energy, the negative energy I'm feeling from my boss is making me crazy. I mean, how do you deal with somebody like that? I, I assume that'll be a contract position where you're getting paid, um, but you still have to deal with that person. So, so that's your risk. <laughs> How do you deal with that person? So in, in understanding what the problem is. So there's a management problem, there's an individual problem. Now, in theory, I'm being hired by the institution to make this person compliant, right? Because ultimately the, the institution is paying me to get a result that they want. This person has to do their job and do it in the right way. Meanwhile, we've got someone who's resistant because they're an old hippie. And I say, oh, folks, when you see me, that's not a 24-year-old's face. So the result winds up being <laughs> you build a relationship with someone. And one of the things I'll ask someone along the lines of is, what are you doing here? Why are you still on this job? Right. You know, it's like, it obviously makes you miserable. Like, what, what's, what keeps you here? And that becomes a gateway to honesty. Because... I want to know what I'm really working with when I work with someone. I want to understand what their motivations are. Because if it's impossible to make them compliant, then all that's going to happen is people are going to be butting heads all the time. And yeah. that's pointless. You know, sometimes I'll tell the institution I'm going to coach them out of here. So <laughs> be, be patient with me while I get them the hell out of here because they're not prepared to be compliant. Sometimes in the relationship, they realize their part in the process and thus can start, I don't want to say making amends because it's not really about amends. It's about taking self-corrective action. But normally it's about the relationship between myself and the other person, like a therapist does, that the work is really done. Interesting stuff. I. I, I think that's, uh, I mean, it's like God's work you're doing uh, to help people find themselves and uh, redirect their own skills or, you know, the, see the 
pathway towards uh, reinvention through upskill or reskill or who knows, an awakening of some kind, right? And sometimes the issue is skills deficiencies. You know, they feel frustrated, so they're putting up roadblocks in front of themselves. So I can't possibly do this. I don't know. Fill in the blank. And the idea becomes, how do you get them to get out of their own way? Because I know of very few people who really want to be in the boat that that person's in. They really want to enjoy life and enjoy the things that they do. And thus, my job is to connect with that person and help them connect with themselves and what the truth is about themselves. I don't presume to know that going in. And remember, I'm working with the stereotypic hippie you know, uh, character that uh, has been presented here. I have to work with someone to understand what their story is, what's getting in their way, and help them overcome the self-imposed limitations so they get what they want. Sometimes it involves mediation between the two parties. You know, there's a wound, the hurt that's come up that gets in the way. And now a word from our co-sponsors. You know, our programs wouldn't happen without the wonderful support of our advertisers. Here they are. Something that's really neat is that the Bridge School partners with various organizations to provide learning for their students. For example, we partner with a major ballet company and we are able to enroll several of their students into our school. So now not only is the student able to participate in a school and have a seamless transition while they're very active in their ballet career, but now they have um, other dancers that are with them that are doing some of the same courses. So it's almost becoming a, a camaraderie where they're taking similar courses, they're working together on their ballet, and really being able to form this great partnership with these organizations to provide a needed service. A lot of times um, there are student athletes who will spend hours and hours at the gym or um, at the, the basketball courts, wherever it is. And if they're attending a traditional school, they're in school from eight to three. They get a quick snack and then they're at the gym for three to four hours in the evening. Coming to us and having that partnership, they're able to break that up throughout the day. They can have a morning practice, get some schooling in, have an afternoon practice, finish their schooling in the evening. So there's that flexibility. And additionally, if there are tournaments or performances, it's fantastic because if there's a week where they have shows straight through, they can take that week off of learning and then pick back up when they're done. So it offers this great flexibility. And for the program owners of these sports leagues, it is a win-win situation for them because they see this need. They see this need that their students need to make sure that they are obtaining the grades necessary to be successful adults in, in our country and in other countries. But it provides them an environment where they can be successful at both. This episode from the Meeting Room of Global TV Talk Show is brought to you by The Bridge School, the accredited international online private school of choice at bridgek12.org Porch Light Rental and Destination Services Reduce your renter lump sum or managed relocation costs Visit them at porchlightrental.com Cube Monk, featuring the world's first smart cube Track your goods with our advanced GPS system Welcome to the future of moving and relocation at cubemonk.com. Primestone Partners, featuring corporate, government, and developer housing solutions, as well as senior level advisory services. Find them at primestonepartners.com. And by airs.com. With our full range of services, we can help design and manage your international relocation. Find us at airs.com. Insured Nomads provides protection and peace of mind with health insurance, travel insurance, group, or tailored insurance for the globally mobile. Visit us at insurednomads.com. And by International Auto Source. 
We are the vehicle experts for expats, featuring all major brands of automobiles with flexible solutions and financing. On the web at intlauto.com. Hi, my name is Christine. I'm a nurse from the Philippines and I got to know IAS through Worldwide Health Staff Solutions. And I want to thank IAS, especially to Matthew for helping me get my car um, stress-free, headache-free. And so I just want to show you the car that I got. So it's a RAV4 XLE 2020. As an expat moving to the USA, relocating is exciting, but it can also be stressful. Getting a car, truck, or SUV for personal transportation is usually a high priority. That's where International Auto Source comes in. We make getting the vehicle you want for your work assignment or academic program easy, so you're ready to drive when you arrive. Our product specialists have helped over 50,000 expatriates with their personal transportation needs, making us the largest international auto retailer in the world. International Auto Source gives you flexible payment options to buy, lease, or rent a vehicle from the world's leading auto brands, arrange financing on a purchase or lease without a U.S. credit history, social security number, or driving record, get full insurance coverage, and get approved easily through our low-rate factory-backed financing programs. And because we're an authorized distributor of the world's leading automotive brands, our no-haggle prices are competitive, and the buying experience is hassle-free. We'll even guarantee your new vehicle will be ready the day you arrive. With over 20 years of experience in the global community, we are the vehicle experts for expats. We are International Auto Source. Let's shift gears a little bit and uh, imagine that your customer, uh, your, your personal customer is um, 32 years old and uh, just a whiz kid when it comes to tech, all right? And yet the people skills, you know, he always, he, let's just say it's a he, never cared, always should be alone, think it through make it work on the keyboard and and make things happen but he's not getting anywhere and he's a lot of people are getting po'd at him uh because he doesn't relate yet he has so much knowledge that the company needs and so the company hires you to get into this guy's head and you find out if it's worthwhile keeping him, <laughs> uh, but he's got to go through a, a change. And boy, that, that would be a big challenge, I would assume. And his name is Steve Jobs, and we're talking about him as Hewlett Packard when he was a fruitopian, and he had body odor as well. So actually, he was in his <laughs> 20s in that story. But um, no matter- How about that? The, the question comes down to is, can you turn a, a uh, a sow into a silk purse. Is it within them to do that? Do they want to do it or are they going to fight you every step along the way? Maybe the goal becomes you teach them social skills and help them become more effective in how they interact with people, pointing out, I know you're right all the time, but What's happening is in the way that you're presenting it, you're annoying people and you're getting fights back. Is there a way that you can see to present your eyes differently than minimize the arguing, even though the other person's stupid all the time? In other words, you connect with them where they are. And in this particular case, I'm doing what in the, in the school of uh, 
a, a psychotherapy I learned is called an overjoin. You connect with them and take their thinking to an extreme level so that they feel understood. And thus I connect with them at a deep level. And if they fight back with me, that's okay too. They say, no, they're not stupid. Okay, that's good. Because that's a strengthening position with them. And thus they're able to then explain to me how they see the other person. And that gives me insights into their way of thinking. So it's, you know, I, I can't simplify things uh, for every stereotype, but what I can say is for a person like this, it's actually pretty easy because they normally want to feel understood. They want to feel as though they've got someone in their corner. And I'm certainly not a threat to them. And if they ask me, so why do they want me to work with you? Uh, because they see that there's certain things that aren't working and what you're doing. They love a lot of the stuff that you do, but there are a couple of things that are problematic from their point of view. And rather than get into arguments, they brought me in as an outsider to help. Oh, well, screw you. And I've gotten that message at times as well. So, so yeah, so let's look at a little bit different, uh, take a, a step to the right a little bit or left. Um, and we're talking about this DNI and belonging business. Okay. Um, so let's just say that um, there's a, a person of color mm -hmm. or Asian or maybe gay or whatever, you know, and the others, most of the others around in the company are none of that. And so it's, I'm sure you've had this experience. So, my son is both Asian and gay, by the way. So, uh, I'll simply say I have a life that experience is with this. Really interesting. Wow. As an outsider in a culture where often they recognize they're an outsider uh, and they find it difficult to navigate. So, how does this person um, negotiate a situation like this? So, first of all, I want to understand it from the employer's perspective because I know the employer's got blind spots. <laughs> they are missing certain things about the cultural difference in experience, uh, yeah. about being a, of a dominant culture of one form or another, and they're not aware of the impact. Now, one of the things that I know uh, from talking to people of color, male and female, and putting my son aside from this equation, is they don't feel understood, appreciated, valued, or invited into the conversation. Right. One of the classic uh, scenarios. Right. The, uh, the from, outsider. Yeah. Right. And one of my my favorite scenarios is from the days that, like a month ago, when women are on the outside in business, and there's the management meeting around the conference table. And all the guys get around the conference table and the women are on the outside seating. There's messages in that. They don't think they belong. And thus, even if they're there first, they're going to take the outside ring. How do you bring them in? And it's little things that build up over the course of time that create the outsider mentality that the institution and its managers and its leaders are often oblivious to. They just think, that's where they want to sit they don't take any meaning to it and they take no corrective actions so you know in situations where you're dealing with the gay asian how do you bring them into the conversation how do you invite them in and help them be inclusive how do you hire others like them you know, so that they're not the only one. Like there was a, a nonprofit that I was involved with for many, many years, and they realized in the leadership of the organization, if there was a person of color running one of their retreat weekends, that man felt fairly isolated. So the leadership created the concept of it's not just going to be one person of color on that, on that leadership, it's going to be at least two. So that in this way, there's a shared experience that the white heterosexual guys could never really connect with. And although there were commonalities of experiences and understandings, it's different when you see things through a lens that only you really know about. It's like the first time a friend of mine explained to me the idea of driving while black. I was stunned when I heard this. 
Now, this is going back 15, 20 years ago, and it still yeah, goes on. This, this, the same problem, right? Yeah. It's yeah. a unique experience different than mine that I can't relate to at the same level. I can do it intellectually, but I also know that, you know, when my son was living in North Carolina, and he was starting to drive. I knew he was a speeder and I knew he was going to get pulled over at one point. And yes, it happened. And I'd already told him how to keep his hands so as not to deal with the fear that a cop has. And just, you know, take away that concern that the police officer has because you're not going to have a weapon. <laughs> and yes, he's supposed to do it differently, but they don't. So what do you do? So lots of nuances in the corporate situation where you're dealing with the outsider and how to make it a more inclusive environment for them. So it could be religious, it could be male, female, as well as what we were just talking about. It could be race, religion, you know, for Muslim people in the United States these days, or uh, Hindu people in the United States today. You know, you're from a, a, not the dominant culture. And people have blind spots, like, you know, from having worked in recruiting, I can't tell you how many racist remarks I would hear from about people from India, time and again, from people who know better. But again, those kind of generalizations happen. So yeah. how do you break those cultural behaviors that exist within an institution where you expect someone to sit there and go, ha, 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 ha. that's very funny when you just insulted me and, and made an anti-Semitic remark. Yeah, <laughs> very funny. <laughs> I can't let that go by. So for those of you who are in leadership roles, you have to be conscious of the impact of what you say, don't say, do and don't do upon those of different target groups, those groups that are not part of dominant cultures, that you cause yourself to lose them and lose their best, all because you had that blind spot. And from your standpoint, when confronted with it, you may say, oh my God, I had no idea. And I know that. Right. right. So this is really an interesting conversation, and I really appreciate you. So with COVID, and it looks like the vaccine uh, is going to be a slow rollout, a slow walk, <laughs> but uh, it looks like there's, it looks like it's going to come uh, for those who want it. I've rose my, raised my hand right away and said, I volunteer, I'll do it. And uh, yet others don't want to do that at all. Uh, for whatever the reason. So, um, you, is, this is a new issue now, isn't it? People, uh, it's, it's, I don't know, anti-vaxxers, you know, it's not really political, but it is. And yet it's brought into the workplace now because the company doesn't want anybody coming into the office who's not vaccinated, assuming that, right? Mm -hmm. and and that's a whole new thing. And one of the question marks, of course, is going to be if you've actually had the virus, does that allow you to become immune from spread or receipt? Because there's Nobody no clear to know. Yeah. There's no clear answer to that because, as I understand it, there are multiple strains of COVID nineteen. Yeah, For example, it, it keeps mutating. Right, which gives me the idea that we have an initial vaccine that works against a particular or particular strains like flu does. And every year we may have to have another shot. We'll find out because we don't know yet. The government rushed in order to get people protected. And I give them a world of credit for putting their money where their mouth was and streamlining an operation. And there's more that we don't know and we're only gonna learn over the course of time. So from, yeah. a, corporate, from a corporate perspective, you know, there's more information that you're going to need to have. And um, in one firm where I'm working with someone who's a sales professional uh, who says, I can't leave my house. You know, I'm over 60. I'm overweight. I'm a, a person who's at high risk. And his sales manager goes, that's fine. I really don't care. Just hit your numbers. 
Do what you got to do. Do your performance. I want to see results. But you can work from home. No problem. And there's going to come a time where there's going to be more expectations. And that's going to be true from every employer. So how do people get in touch with you, Jeff Altman? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, my website, thebiggamehunter.us. You can schedule time for a free discovery call, schedule time for Q&A with me there. There's lots of formats that I can help with. And while you're there, by the way, I've got a great blog with thousands of posts that will help you with hiring more effectively, job search, managing and leading, workplace-related issues. Go explore there. But you know, if you, for contact with me, the website is a good first step. And my LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn.com forward slash IN forward slash The Big Game Hunter. That's The Big Game Hunter. And mention that you saw the video. I'd love, yeah, that's just cool. like, I just like knowing how people come to me. And yeah. uh, once we're connected, you'll get a lot of great information from me. So, one of your slogans is no BS. And so, uh, talk English to me. You know, I started that with my podcast, uh, No BS Job Search Advice Radio. And it's, I started in November 2010 with bad audio and uh, now more than 2,000 episodes later, um, I understood that for job hunters, and I was doing recruiting at that time, job hunters have no idea whether the person they're talking to is competent at what they do. Right. And they operate with a lot of misinformation. It's the same thing with coaching, too. It's like a mystical science. Myst Ooh, we're going to sit around with the Ouija board and divine <laughs> what the solution should be. So I created a podcast, uh, No BS Job Search Advice Radio, designed to give people information about how to job hunt more effectively. Because I understood there's a mythology to search, and I want to take the mythology out of it. And through that, they get an idea of how I think, how I approach things, and develop trust in me. That's very good. Jeff Altman, thanks very much for being our guest today on Global TV Talk Show. <laughs> and uh, we'll hope to uh, have you back on at another time. Super happy to help. Great. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. Be great. Thank you for joining us in the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show. Have a wonderful day and stay safe.